Thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, for anyone who uh, may join us or may lose connection, uh, we will be live on the Matsuda Institute Facebook. Uh, but without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Maya Satora, who will be our moderator uh, and leading our conversation today. Thank you so much, Maya. Mahalo, Jose. Thank you for uh, supporting, nurturing, building this uh, careers in peace building series. I really thank you for all of your hard work and welcome everyone. Welcome to Dr. Tim Shriver and to all of you in attendance in this room, as well as those following on Facebook Live or other platforms. And uh, to those who are watching the recording afterwards, welcome. Uh, I'm really looking forward to today's conversation about a new story for children educators and a new science of promoting peace, inclusivity, and learning. And I'm really delighted and honored to have um, Dr. Tim Shriver here. Um, given his commitment to bridging divides and finding shared spaces of endeavor and community, a number of people actually have recommended that we connect. And one of those people was Scarlett Lewis. Scarlett uh, tragically lost her son in the Sandy Hook shooting and has since in her son's memory and name created the Choose Love Movement, which you can find out about on chooselovemovement.org. And it's in over a hundred countries, I think now 3 million uh, students have access to this social emotional uh, learning program that is thoughtful and helps with compassion and action, forgiveness, and uh, choosing to participate. And I'm incredibly proud of her. At any rate, welcome uh, today. I hope that you uh, find in Tim's work and words a number of um, interesting opportunities for greater participation, connection, uh, for us to build bridges, to unite with one another, to become more inclusive. Uh, most of you are likely familiar with Tim's work as the chairman of Special Olympics International. He's also the co-founder of Unite, an initiative to promote national unity and solidarity across differences. And as a former classroom educator, he co-founded and currently chairs the Collaborate the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning Castle, which is um, sort of the standard bearing, carrying, and, and supporting organization that helps uh, social emotional learning all over this country and indeed inspires it uh, globally. It is the leading school reform organization, I would say, in the field of social emotional learning. So those of you who are educators or students at the School of Education have undoubtedly referenced Castle's work um, on more than one occasion. As we navigate through the conversation today, uh, do listen deeply for how all of Tim's experiences have lent themselves to his lens and commitment on these important issues. Uh, he is creative, he's an author, uh, co-editor, a film producer, a husband, father of five. And let's just dive in, but welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Doc. Thank you Dr. Meyer, for having me for that generous introduction. Thanks everybody for joining. I'm looking forward to the conversation. All right, well, let's talk a bit more about your journey to this moment. Uh, we at the Careers and Peace Building Talk Story Series try to promote and understand the myriad and winding pathways that people can take to peace building. And we feel that everyone has a place to enter the stream. And I'd like to hear about where you uh, waited in this water. You're the author of the New York Times bestseller, um, titled Fully Alive, Discovering What Matters Most, which I enjoyed and found purposeful and meaningful. Uh, when you um, think about your journey and your bio uh, and in reflecting on your multifaceted contributions to the world, uh, tell me, how did you get here? How did you know what mattered most to you? And what was most instrumental in shaping your perspective? Well, thank you. Thank you, Maya. I, I, I mean, 
I guess the first thing that strikes me in, in the question is, you know, the journey or the path to peace building. Um, I think I would probably invite a minor correction that the path of peace building, not the path to peace building. Uh, I feel like for almost everyone I know, and I'm guessing, I, I don't wanna be, uh, um, impose my views, but I'm guessing that for everyone on this call and for people that will be thinking about and thinking about their careers in this space, that peace building is a journey in and of itself. One may embark upon it uh, in early childhood. Uh, one may embark upon it by trying to heal the wounds of one's parents in adolescence. Many people find themselves in that position uh, in, throughout their lives. You may embark upon it by trying to help a friend in third or fourth grade. Uh, there, there are, peace building is a path and what I have found is that if you're oriented toward the path, the path leads you. You find your way to the people that you need, that need, uh, that are offering the kind of counsel and courage and transformation that you're in need of in a particular moment. Uh, because I, I'm certainly of the faith that the, the path of peace building is a path of transformation of oneself into a peace builder. Um, and that never, I mean, I wish, you know, I think when I was younger, I thought, you know, I'm going to get this pretty soon and then I'll have it, you know, and then I'll be able to package it and then I'll be able to teach it or tell it or talk about it or brag about it or show everybody how to do it. Uh, geez, that's, uh, that feels like a long time ago that I had that um, illusion. Uh, the, the path is really, in my experience, uh, my a path of constant um, deepening of my own capacity to see peace. Uh, so let's, let's not be too boring about that. I, you know, for me, um, I guess there's so many different moments in my career. I, I was raised in a family that where politics was very important, where big ideals, you know something about that, you know, big ideals, programs, speeches, historic moments, and that was the water I grew up drinking. Uh, the well from which I was, uh, was, my thirst was quenched in many ways. Uh, at some level, I knew pretty early on that I was more interested in the personal dimensions of social and political change. So I, starting very young, I mean, I was, I asked, you know, for summer vacations or trips, and instead of wanting to go to a camp, I, I begged my father in seventh grade, could I go out and live in an Indian reservation? Uh, because I wanted to understand indigenous cultures and try to, you know, make sense of the past in our country of so much abuse, and violence, and uh, oppression against our indigenous brothers and sisters. So I don't, I don't give myself any credit for that. It was just the hunger was within in me. I wanted to go and learn. At 15 years old, I went to, again, ask my father, could I go to a Peace Corps site? I wanted to go to the Peace Corps for the summer. He said, well, you don't do Peace Corps in high school. You do Peace Corps when when you're an adult and you have to do it for two years. And I begged and begged and so finally got a chance to go serve with, alongside Peace Corps volunteers at the age of 15 in Guatemala after the earthquake there uh, in the 70s, uh, you know, rebuilding homes. So I guess I was just drawn to wanting to be on the front lines in a more intimate relationship with social, political justice questions. And what I found gosh, it's almost embarrassing to admit, was that I had come with a lot of assumptions about my capacity to help other people. And um, if it's a little embarrassing to admit, I, I admit it because I think it's so important for my personal transformation to realize that what I was really coming to do was to heal the gap that I was in part responsible for creating, not to fix people who were on the other side of that gap. I was really chastened in my, especially in my early career as a teacher by my students. Uh, I think they saw in me, I hope they saw in me someone who cared, but they also probably saw in me 21 years old, college graduate, you know, white skin, uh, prominent maybe background and privilege. They probably saw in me arrogance, they probably saw in me some degree of um, irritate. I mean, I was irritating, I'm sure. But I was, I think I was irritating because I wasn't as good at listening as I was at trying to show people how to change. 
I wasn't yet open to change. I'll never forget, you know, uh, my, my um, one of my professors saying to me, you know, Tim, your work is on the inner life of kids. Many of your students have very troubled inner lives. I mean, I must have been 22, Maya, and I I had never heard the term inner life. I, I didn't. I never thought that my work was with the inner life. I thought my work was with math and science, social studies, homework, SAT prep, you know, uh, getting in shape, all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden I was thinking to myself, my God, are my kids trying to speak to me from a place of, from their inner life? And what the heck is my inner life? You know, like, and it, it, it opened me up to starting to hear kids say to me, one student of mine, I, I brought, a group of uh, young men to a college presentation. These were high school kids. And the college presentation was about all kids in the college that wanted to volunteer. And I had these students in a, in a club I'd formed at the high school who were so, so you know, uh, putatively the subject, right? They, these kids would want to come help. They'd want to, you know, the college kids would want to come volunteer and maybe run a club or mentor or tutor. And my students came, went to talk to these college kids. And there was a big room, 200 kids in it, and four or five kids from my, the high school. And I was sitting there just letting the kids talk. And uh, one, one student after another was speaking to the crowds, sort of chastising them and saying, well, we don't really like you. And we don't really like when you guys come to our school. We don't really like the way your college sits in our neighborhood. And we don't really appreciate the way we get treated by people in the college. And one of the college students got up and said, after about 20 minutes, said, it looks like, sounds to me like you don't want our help. And one of my students, I'll never forget it, he said, it's not that we don't want help. It's that we don't want you coming in on a white horse, reaching down and pretending to help us from your perch. And I thought to myself, you know, that probably was me. You know, thinking that I was coming in to offer that kind of help. And these young men, particularly in that group, that was a young men's group, were so clear that their hearts were open and raw and hungry, wounded, angry, loving, compassionate, gentle, smart. But the only thing they couldn't tolerate is humiliation and condescension and smart that they couldn't, you know, and how wise of them to reject me and others when they had that whiff, that smell, that aura of not so much peace building, but change making, not so much healing as fixing. And that had to be beat. I mean, I'm just, I'm being honest, that had to be beaten out of me. Uh, and I am so grateful. I'm so grateful for all the nights I went home after work thinking I'm a failure and days I stand in front of students and think I wasn't reaching them and moments when students would uh, be very tough on me. I'm so grateful because at some level, it gave me the chance to finally realize that what was at stake in peace building was the transformation of all of our hearts to be able to see one another clearly, to see the beauty, the unimaginable beauty in oneself and in others. And that from that view, all peace was possible, but without that view, um, only manipulation and uh, control and um, distortion was, was, was likely. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's a little snapshot of, I hope people are probably signing off. Why are we listening to this guy? What a disaster. He's not, all... a, not at all. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I, I think everyone here likely appreciates very much your honesty, your vulnerability and your humility. I, I uh, know you are also not alone, you know, having grown up uh, in Indonesia uh, with uh, 
mother from Kansas, a father from Indonesia. I saw very often the kind of work that Americans did in Indonesia, the development work as uh, being well-intentioned, but largely ineffectual because there wasn't that time taken to really listen to the needs, to the strengths, uh, to the community source solutions on the ground and in missing context and missing culture and missing uh, the humility necessary to uh, listen and learn from one another, uh, there was a, a lot of missed opportunity and some harm done. And uh, I know that there are many spaces where we need to sort of reconcile these good intentions with um, a mandate and a need to, to listen deeply to the truth, not only um, of a particular place and, and moment, but also to uh, reflect uh, on our intentions and our uh, capacity to understand one another. I wanna th thank you for reminding us to be vigilant, I guess, in that way. And also, it was really important that you made note of that shift. It's an important word to change uh, the journey to peace building to the journey of we at the Matsunaga Institute and uh, we peace educators. Sorry, if I, if often, I ruin your brand, I don't, I don't mean it. That no, uh, no, we, we often say that the whole idea is to think about how we can participate in building peace within, between, and in service to um, our beloved community, regardless of where we are, regardless of what we study, regardless of our age and our uh, bank accounts. So it is important to remember that this is about work that can be transformative at any age and stage of life, um, provided we are willing, interested, and, and supported in that. So thank you. I want to pick up on this notion of listening a bit. You, you recently co-edited The Call to Unite, Voices of Hope and Awakening. And I want to think about today, the so social um, divide, the societal divisiveness, the political polarization that um, affects children, families, and schools. And I want to ask you, how do you think uh, our understanding of one another, our capacity to work together has been injured in recent years? And, and how do we build a more just and unified future? And what is the role of listening? And how do we listen more deeply and well to one another? I know that was a multi-layered question, but yeah, yeah just wanna think, I want us to think about how we can build a more unified and just future and the role of listening in that and how we can listen. Listening is a skill and we don't often give one another the opportunity to practice yeah yeah well let me let me first start with the premise that we're hopelessly divided and polarization and hostility uh, are everywhere um so let, let's 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 take it for granted that that's true uh in our country in the united states people feel that we're more divided than we've ever been closer to civil war than we've ever been uh more than half of us want our states to secede from the union um, that's one version of what's going on today. Another version, which we don't read about or see as much in the media, is a flowering of alternative and new models of uh, creative social entrepreneurship, uh, creative spiritualities that are emerging from traditional religions in which many of the gifts of traditional religions are present, even though, uh, even as we shed some of the, uh, some of the uh, imperialism of traditional religions, some of the closed nature of imperial religions, of traditional religions. Uh, we see a creative interest in, in voice uh, across more than ever before. People who have been excluded have stronger, more powerful, more resonant voices than we've ever had in our history. In my view, it doesn't mean we've got the work done, it just means that we're hearing, listening, and seeing more. So I think there's two narratives. One is very loud, very, very easy to cover, very popular, and here's the here's the here's the 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 wrinkle. the The loud, angry, polarized narrative is very lucrative. 
you get paid. Uh, Maya, if you said on this call today, I hate, just fill in the blank, and such and such is a disgusting, outrageous, uh, uh, you know, a person and has done something uh, that's beyond the pale, deserves to be punished interminably, and never, if you just said that, Phil, I don't care who you'd say it about, uh, we could get you on TV tomorrow and get you millions of followers. You would, in effect, uh, if I can use the language, be getting paid. Uh, if you spoke in the language which you're much more likely to use, which is more, I think, natural to you, uh, you're likely to have deep resonance with people who are listening deeply and have a long-term effect, I believe, on the culture, but much less likely to get paid with fame and money. So what's my point? My point is that, yes, we have a polarized world, but we also have an alternate narrative. And it's up to us to recognize that the people that are selling us hatred, and I'm sorry to say, you and I both have many political people who are close to us. I'm sorry to say many politicians trade in the selling of hatred and contempt for people of the other party, not all, but many do. And the media trades is commerces in hatred. Now, when I was a kid, I don't know if this would happen to you in Indonesia, my mother used to say, you don't use the word hate in this house. Hate is not allowed. You can say you don't like someone, you can say you don't agree with someone, but you do never say you hate someone. I don't know if anybody else on this call ever had their parent or caregiver say that, right? This is this way we, now, if you say, uh, I hate uh, Mitch McConnell, or I hate Chuck Schumer, you get a standing ovation today, <laughs> depending on which group you're in, right? Yeah, I mean, it depends on which group. You don't get, you don't get a standing ovation from both, you get one from, so these are, uh, these are deep manipulations of our greatest fear instincts. Uh, this has been actually proven. The way the media covers the news is often designed to manipulate us into fear. So there's a business profiting from making me want to hate people of the other political party. So I want to say to people, it's up to us to reject that business model. Forget what you think about Mitch McConnell or Chuck Schumer for a moment. Just recognize that the business model that's making, that's driving much of your opinion right now is based on people profiting from you being afraid of the other people. We, uh, Arthur Brooks calls it the outrage industrial complex. If they are active, compassionate, deep listeners, Maya, to your point, they don't raise money. Mostly, again, not all, not all. Mostly they don't raise money. They don't get PAC support. They don't get endorsements from the more active political groups. And they struggle, particularly in a gerrymandered country, uh, for attention. If they're peace builders, if they're flamethrowers, uh, you got to you got to step up. So we have a system that rewards uh, our deepest fears and our worst instincts. Now, uh, it doesn't mean that that's all we've got. It just means that it's being that part of us is being rewarded. You know the Cherokee story about the child who goes to the grandparent and says. You know, some days I'm happy, some days I'm not. Some days I feel good, some days I feel mean. The grandparent says to the child, you have two wolves inside of you. you maybe you all know the story, the good wolf and the bad wolf. And the little child says to the, to the elder, a witch is going to win. And the elder says, the one you feed, right? So our fear-based angry wolf is being fed to excess. And our peace-building wolf is starving, literally starving. So this is a long way of saying when we introduce the field of social and emotional learning, we called it social much because we thought there was social competence and emotional intelligence built into it. So we labeled it social and emotional learning. One of the core skills is at learning, teaching kids active listening. And we, this is now being taught, uh, you mentioned uh, Scarlett Lewis's program has, has very good active listening training where you can sit down and Learn a paradigm, learn how to listen deeply, how to um, have your body language speak to, uh, how to repeat back what people say, how to acknowledge their message instead of interrupting, instead of trying to one up them, instead of saying, oh, that reminds me, I too have that problem, you know, just when, you, when the person's actually wanting to be heard. So we can learn, starting in middle school, the skills of an active listener. And 
of course, when you learn active listening, when you learn deep listening, of course, what you first start to notice is that you probably missed so much of what the person had been saying to you. It could be your husband or your wife or your sister or your brother or your children or your best friend. You notice, my goodness, I never really listened to them before. And then oftentimes people who have transformative experiences, learning active, learning listening skills, find out, well, your reason I never listened to her or him is because I actually never listened to myself. I never listened deeply to my own inner voice. So the good news is we can teach these things. It's not, it's not much more difficult than teaching math or the placement of a comma or the capitalization of letters at the beginning of sentences. These are all skills. We all learn how to capitalize our letters at the beginning of a sentence, put a period at the end. We can also learn how to make eye contact and you can practice it. And at the end of a uh, instructional unit, you can be pretty good at it. Uh, and if you get reinforcement for it and rewarded for it, you can become almost expert at it. And it can help you transform your life and lean closer and closer into the path towards peace building and further and further away from the distracted energy that often leads to indifference and uh, misunderstanding and broken relationships. Thank you. And um, I, I appreciate so much that um, you use the phrase active listening because it is not a passive act. It is one that requires that reflection. It is one that requires that we utilize our intuition, right? And we try to imagine what the other person is feeling and intending and their universal needs and that sort of thing. It's a very active and, and rigorous and vigorous process. And yeah. um, we, we, we teach double listening, right? So where we listen uh, for the truth of words and then we listen for the truth ben behind beneath and beside those words and right. and then we kind of speak back the words or intention that we as we understand it and that sort of thing so it really is um a, a process that can be learned and taught and but it is multifaceted and yeah. and and so vital i want to talk a little bit more about um, equity, diversity, and inclusiveness. Throughout your career, you've consistently uh, pushed to kind of move uh, outward the frontiers of inclusion. Um, and we are obviously hearing a lot now about uh, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion, DEI. Can you share a little bit about your work with the Special Olympics in that regard and what you learned from that process and how you think uh, that has expanded uh, perspectives and possibilities for all of us, you not just those who are um, differently abled, but, uh, but indeed, you know, you know, anyone who might... Um, uh, live or think uh, or move differently? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, thank you for the question. And thank you for asking in the context of people with intellectual developmental challenges, differences, neurodiverse people. And I thank you for asking because most of the time people don't think of them in the context of DEI. Uh, they think of the more politically and more culturally and more socially visible issues around race and gender and sexual orientation uh, at, and to some extent historical oppression, you know, pop, subpopulations that have experienced those kinds of uh, things. And all those groups very much deserve to be at the center of the DEI conversation. Uh, make no, no I, I'm not gonna, I don't challenge that at all. I just think that many times um, gosh, it's, it's in a way it's, it's mysterious. Uh, we all have uh, with one or two degrees of separation, a person in, in, in our cr close community who has an intellectual or developmental disability. Uh, we all have a neighbor, a cousin, an uncle, an aunt, a brother-in-law, uh, a person, uh, 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 maybe a, uh, a sibling we never met. I can't tell you the number of people I still meet who say, oh, you know, I did have a brother. Uh, but he was put in an institution, I never met him or she. Um, but 
you know, this issue of uh, neurodiverse people are close in every culture in the world. Every, every culture in the world uh, is not limited by any historical accident or by any particular historical evolution. And yet uh, they remain hidden. We remain deeply uncomfortable with their presence in general. Uh, they remain outside of our social and our political activism for the most part, not completely, but for the most part. Uh, and we continue to shape uh, our responses to, uh, to, the, to the DEI agenda, most of the time thinking to ourselves, well, yes, we do wanna hire uh, more people from this background and we do wanna make our, uh, our culture and our school more accepting of people from this background, but we almost never include people with intellectual and developmental differences. Isn't it interesting? And we all know them and they're in all of our families. And uh, in, in many cases, they are us. Many of us are neurodiverse, and yet we don't talk about it. Um, so, you know, what I learned in the Special Olympics movement, you know, my mom's great genius was to rebrand, if I, it sounds tacky, but to relabel, rename, recategorize people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. At the time that Special Olympics was started, just to be clear, for, the, for, for those of you interested in history, 1968, there were almost 200,000 Americans locked in institutions uh, for life. So, uh, uh, 20, you know, uh, 200,000 people, many of them from birth, placed in an institution in the United States. In, our, our institutions were bulging in 1968, more people in them than at any other time in our history. So here we are in the midst of the burgeoning peace movement, the maturing and growing in power, the civil rights movement, the women's movement get being born. And we were growing the number of people we were in effect throwing away for life uh, based on what? Based on their IQ score. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to believe it, right? Uh, so in that moment, my mom and the moms, mostly moms, I, 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 we need to acknowledge it's mostly women, decided to create the Special Olympics movement. But their most audacious me message was that, you know these people, you know the, the, the baby you gave up at birth because the doctor told you to, you know the brother you've never seen or you only visit once a year, you know the, the uncle uh, who was taken from your family because he, he didn't fit in, you know he, he's Olympic. He's the best, highest, fastest, strongest, bravest example of human endeavor. And people had to be going, Maya, wait a minute. Is that a joke? You know, you have a 12 year old with Down syndrome who's running 100 meters in 30 seconds. That, she's not Olympic, is she? Until you watched her until you saw human bravery, until you saw the brash, bold, stop at nothing willingness to throw your arms up in the air when you give your all to something, until you know by watching that she has shown you something about yourself that you are afraid to admit, which is that you're broken and you wanna to try to. Until you've let her example sink in there's a part of your journey to peace building, which you haven't yet traveled. And when I go to these events, as I did last week, I must've been to 50,000 in my life, I still cry. And I still find myself moved. And I still find myself challenged and changed because I know those athletes are speaking again to my wounds, to my discomfort, to my desire. I hate to say this because people may think I'm being corny. My my hidden, almost embarrassing desire to be like them. If only I could be that brave, you know, that unashamed of who I am. That's, that's to me, the great journey of real diversity and real equity and real inclusion. Yes, there are justice issues and, and there are structural issues and there are economic issues and there are power issues, but there are also spiritual issues in diversity and in equity and inclusion.
and the athletes of the Special Olympics movement. You know, there's 190 countries now that have local games. I just came back from a bowling tournament, an ice skating competition, uh, uh, a youth leadership seminar in the United Arab Emirates. You know, they have uh, several thousand athletes participating in local community-based work there. And this is a population that was hidden in, in much of the Arab world, much of the whole world. And now they've got a very robust local Special Olympics program growing. So this is all over the world. People coming face to face with uh, what it means to have been an excluder, which is what diversity and equity and inclusion really is trying to name. It's trying to name that we, me, you, many of us, most of us, all of us, I dare say, have been excluders. We've been dividers. We've been a us versus them. We've lived in an us versus them world. And it, the Special Olympics movement doesn't have a legislative agenda. It's not a political movement. It's not the best at you know, uh, taking people to court or passing bills or electing you know, candidates, all of which is super important. But I don't think there's any movement that's any better than the Special Olympics movement at challenging the hearts and mindsets of those of us who have, who, who are still living in a world of us versus them and trying to remind us that there's really just us. I mean, I could go, I could tell you so many stories, Maya, you know, just tell one quickly because it happened many, many years ago, but I was with uh, one of our athletes named Loretta Claiborne. And, you know, some people have said she's like the Michael Jordan of Special Olympics. She ran over 25 marathons finished in the top 100 women, a, a, a young woman with intellectual developmental disabilities, grew up in housing projects, thrown out of school and all that. And uh, she became, she has become, she's now, she's older than I am, uh, still running and still a terrific athlete, but become quite a powerful spokesperson for the values of the Special Olympics movement. But I was, I was taking her to an event um, several decades ago, and we were going to talk to a group of uh, Ivy League alumni and uh, so they said to me, would you like to come and talk about the Special Olympics movement? I said, sure. And I said, I'd like to bring uh, Loretta Claiborne and let, let her give this you know, talk because she can articulate this much better than I can. And I, we're walking into the event and you know, Loretta doesn't speak with any notes. Um, and I said, you know, just make sure to remind them you know, that we need their help and we want athletes to be hired by their businesses. We want athletes to be included in their clubs and all that kind of stuff. And she got up and she gave this talk and She's talking about her experience. And at the end, she said, you know, I just came here to say, uh, I hope you all will realize that you're welcome in our world. In our world, what language you speak doesn't matter, what religion you practice doesn't matter, how fast you run doesn't matter. Our world is, and I was thinking to myself, no, Loretta, we want, we, we're trying to get into their world. That's where all the power is. We're trying to broaden the pathway of our athletes into the world of power and economic force and political influence. And she was like, mm -mm. we have an alternate worldview. And if, and if they can understand, she didn't, she didn't say it this way, if you can understand as a fact what she was saying, how much better it is to live in our world, you'll start to see uh, that you know all all the all the trappings of power and influence that you have aren't as much as you aren't all, all all that they're cracked up to be, and it was a moving experience for me because as soon as she was talking, I was like, oh my god, you know, she's got it so right. You know, that's why I love this movement because when I'm around this movement, the culture, the norms, the lens with which we see is not clouded by the distortions of judgment and power, and approval, and fame, and money, and status. It's, I dare say, almost completely free of all that. And it feels so liberating. Anyway, uh, you know, this, it's Thank the you. Special Olympics movement is just getting started. You know, we're still seen in most parts of the world as a movement, you know, for people with special needs. You know, and can I help? Can I volunteer? I'd love to give. People are very generous. It's unbelievable. I mean, 100,000 events a year, Maya, if you can believe it, 100,000 little events a year all over the world in a non-COVID time anyway. 
and they're all run by volunteers. And uh, in every country, and pretty much in every country. So people are incredibly generous with this movement. Um, but what I think we're starting to be able to name, I think it's always been happening, but we're beginning to name that this is not just a movement for them, but it's a movement from them. And it's a movement inviting the world to see the world as the athletes of Special Olympics so often see it, not universally, but often see it. And with that, with the lens that they have, you hear me talk a lot, I think a lot about changing our lens, not changing what we see, but changing how we see. And I think the athletes and the movement, um, the Special Olympics movement has a lot to teach the world about how to see. Uh, and when you change how you see, you see all kinds of new stuff, right? It's, it's, uh, it's a liberating experience. Absolutely. And nothing corny about anything you just said. And I definitely want to meet your athletes and be part of that world. So I hope I'll be invited. You're very much welcome. <laughs> to join. And I agree that it is about uh, washing our eyes and seeing things differently. And uh, grateful for all of uh, your athletes' efforts and all of your movements and events uh, work to help us to wash our eyes and see ourselves and, and the world in a, in a new way. I um, want in about three minutes to invite you to respond to questions from our audience. So sure. for those of you who are in the room and for those of you who are watching live from elsewhere, if you can put in the chat uh, any questions that you have, please do. And then in the meantime, can we do a, like a little speed round? Um, I'll ask you five questions that you that you can answer. <laughs> I know it, I'm, it's not I'll my try. <laughs> <laughs> that you can answer in less than a minute each. Um, so my first thing is, what is a favorite way of bridge building for you? Um, favorite, play. Play, beautiful. Play, you know, the most fundamental way in which humans learn is by play. Anybody here on this screen has a baby or a child under three, mm -hmm. you'll know that almost all learning takes place through play. It continues to happen that way. We just, for some stupid reason, think that that's not important learning. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think uh, play, uh, getting out of your head and into your body. You know, that's what play is. It's less a cognitive and an analytic and a, uh, a binary world. It's not like, oh, Maya and me, or she's a woman, I'm a man, or she's this color and I'm that color, or she's tall and I'm short, or she's fast and I'm slow. Play, you're just moving, right? you're throwing the ball, you're catching the ball, your, your mind relaxes a bit and your body takes over. Uh, I think it's a powerful, powerful way of communication that we've only begun to tap the, the influence and power of. And I think we do well to get a lot of Republicans and Democrats playing together. Uh, uh, yeah. Literally, I mean, I, well, I know it sounds, point of it sounds trivial, but I think it's important. Right, and well, and that's part of the value, right, of the Olympics in general, yeah. right? It's yeah. it is yes, it's competition, but it's also play. Okay. Yeah. Uh, something that you're round. sorry, I gotta go short. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> something that you're looking forward to in the year ahead, something that that makes you uh feel a sense of promise and optimism. Oh, so many things. Um you know, putting my Special Olympics hat on, we have our USA games, which will take place in Orlando, which aren't canceled, didn't get ruined. And I get emails every day from athletes saying how excited they are. They're going, their coaches. Ran into a coach the other day at an NEA meeting for the for teachers and came up to me on the coach. Here's what he opened up his pad and got his roster on his yellow pad. And here are all the athletes, all their names are all going to Orlando. They're all gonna get on an airplane. They're all gonna meet and see other people. We're gonna be together as a country. I don't know, man, it's pretty exciting. Um, there's a lot of other work going on that I'm very excited about in, in more in the political sphere, but that's one that capitalizes on both my desire for play and my desire for uh, inclusion and unity. Beautiful. Okay, in your unity, book um something that surprised you uh from the stories uh and the and the writing there 
everything. I mean, it sounds like I'm bragging. Uh, the goodness and decency and beauty of the human spirit when invited and welcomed and allowed and given permission to express itself is mind boggling. Lawrence Bartley talking about what he learned in solitary confinement as a prisoner, about compassion, about writing, about apology, around self-forgiveness blows, blew me away. Uh, T.D. Jakes uh, talking about how pain uh, always leaves a gift. So something I, since the, he spoke the words, I'm still working on it, still working on it. He doesn't say pain is a gift. He says pain leaves a gift. Mm. Uh, the transformation that's possible. Uh, you know, I just, I could go on and on. Richard Rohr talking about the apocalypse uh, and the apocalyptic thinking, the pulling back of the veil to try to find the new. Sir Ken Robinson, I mean, the list of uh, beautiful contributions, Oprah's. Uh, talking about a great awake. I mean, it, the, the, and some of these people are well known and some of them are, you've never heard of storefront clerks who write about, you know, one checkout uh, uh, person writing about just what it was like at the beginning of the pandemic, just to be able to look at people as they came down the checkout line and make eye contact enough to try to communicate to people that she loved them. Uh, I mean, you know, you just walk through life and you think if you ever, if we can ever stop long enough to just pay attention to what's right in front of our eyes, it's mm. almost too much, the, the light is almost too much to bear. And um, so I, I felt like, I feel like the book is my companion, it's my guide, it's my coach, it's my uh, invitation to a heart open. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's our brothers and sisters speaking from the heart. Uh, with hope and awakening and um yeah well, it's, that's it's not a one, i'm not good at the one minute answer sorry <laughs> yeah no worries no worries it is a beautiful book and i do hope that those of you listening and in attendance can um can can purchase it and and enjoy it and create your own stories um and and language for for greater unity and 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 connection and interbeing um I have so many other uh, one minute questions, but I need to give space and, and opportunity to this uh, beautiful audience. Uh, there are a number of questions here. Oh my goodness. Um, there are too many um, to cover probably in the time that remains, but um, let me um, ask uh, Pohai here uh, as the first one. Do you think I'm overly optimistic in believing we have more peace builders in our world today than ever before? No, I think it's absolutely, this is kind of the point I was trying to make at the beginning. I think we're in the midst of the flowering and birthing of a whole new culture, uh, a whole new mindset. A whole, some people have, you know, I don't know if you've heard my language of the axial age when, you know, the first axial age when the Buddha and, you know, the Hebrew prophets, and then at the tail end of it, uh, the birth of Jesus and others, you know, they, 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 we speak of this, this several century long period in which the consciousness of the individual, the separation, the idea of a monotheistic God all emerge at the same time in different cultures around the world. Uh, uh, and I think we're in a similar period of enormous transformation where the consciousness of shared being, interbeing, uh, uh, the interwovenness of, of our own individuality itself is just beginning to be born. And I think people will write about the great icons of this period, political, social, cultural, scientific, you know, the Einsteins, the Kings, the Obamas of the world, these people who started to see the emergence of this new consciousness, they'll be they'll be seen as the forerunners of the new. And I think we're seeing it flourishing under the radar, under the radar. Uh, but you go to schools, you know, I was in a middle school not too long ago and talking about bullying, you know, because I worked, for, you know, a lot of the SEL work came out of anti-bullying. And so we were talking to the kids, doing folks groups on bullying. How's it working? What's going on? And finally, one of the kids said to me, it's about an hour into the focus group. She said, you know, you keep asking us about bullying in the school. She said, you know, we don't have it anymore. You know, this kid, this school is pretty good about bullying. She said, but I'll tell you what, she looked at me, I'll tell you what, Mr. Schreiber, you know who the bullies are? Adults. Go home and watch TV. You'll see bullies. 
They're all over the TV. They're not in my school. And, uh, you know, so there's, there's an emergence in young people of a different consciousness, a, a different openness, a different receptivity, um, a different willingness to, to be uh, in relationship to the earth, to each other, to themselves in a new way. And I don't think we have all the right names for it yet. Like we call our movement Unite. I, you know, I like the name. I'm not sure it's the right name. A lot of people think, yeah, I don't think it's, that's boring. But so I'm not sure exactly what the right words are to describe the emerging peace building culture, but I think it's huge. It's just this, you know, it's kind of like coming out from under the ocean and in the top of the ocean, it still looks smooth, but this giant, almost volcanic eruption will come. And I think in time, it will produce big waves that will change the face of the earth. I think the, the final throes of the old consciousness around us, we see it, it's painful violent, it's divisive, it's hostile, bitter, it's fearful, but I, I don't think it's gonna win. Thank you. There is a question here. Um, and uh, I'm going to encourage you, I'm not good at sound bites either, but just- um, just Go short, okay. More questions. <laughs> You're, we love you, we love you. You're great, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we just wanna- um, Yes, okay, sorry. Questions. I'm going to try hard. But, but there is, Kelly um, is asking about uh, Zelensky and, you know, who seems to be selling a positive message. And um, and she's noting that people seem to be motivated by this positive peace message as opposed to the message of fear. How can we capitalize on that? And in this moment uh, of people sort of coming together in support of that. I'm going to come up with a sound bite. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, look, I think it's the greatest opportunity for our country to unite that I've seen almost in my lifetime. Uh, we see a man whose bravery and willingness to risk his life inspires us. We see uh, the wages of violence as being fruitless, cruel, uh, and unproductive. Uh, we see the best in ourselves as Americans, people who are ready to welcome refugees, people who believe in freedom, people who want to do more, people who are generous financially. These are all the gifts. We admire bravery. We admire freedom. We, can, we, dis, we disdain violence, hostility, and aggression. And we are united in that. I think our leaders would do very well to invite Americans right now, all of us, to become agents of welcome, and generosity, and compassion, for the people of Ukraine, yes, but also for the people of Afghanistan, people of Central America, and for each other. And translate the compassion we feel for the Ukrainians and the anger and hostility we feel about violence to disdaining violence at home too. That's the closest I can get to a sound bite. I know it wasn't very good. No, you did great. <laughs> I'm so pleased and grateful. Um, because it is important to bring it you know, to bring it home, to think about our yeah. responsibility, our kuliana, our our capacity to uh, engage in reflective practice, as opposed to simply looking outward and engaging in judgment of others, too. Yeah. So this is uh, that's really important. Um, here's another question from Zephanie. In the grand scheme of your work, uh, and given what we're discussing, what are the issues and opportunities that actually keep you up at night, and or galvanize you to get out of bed in the morning? What keeps me up at night is the judgment and hostility that I think people who are willing to try to love their enemies feel in our culture right now. If I were to say things that, if I were to say, for instance, just, just imagine, I would say I have compassion for Putin. If I put that on social media right now, I'd probably never get a job the rest of my life. Um, if I said I had compassion for Trump voters, I wanted to understand them better. My own po politics is very different from theirs. Uh, again, if I went too far with that message, it would be the end of me because I would be so judged by soundbite mentalities to be um, uh, unacceptably tolerant of evil, racism. You know, And I don't mean to be tolerant of any of those things, but I think it keeps me up at night that we can't heal our relationships, that we are so wedded to judging 
each other that we never give ourselves time to actually articulate or lean into or pray our way into a process of healing. That worries me. I think people are scared of each other and we make ourselves even more bitter and fearful by, by scaring each other. And I think it's a bad cycle, very bad cycle. Not just, not, not, not allowing for, um, not excusing behavior that is violent and oppressive and uh, those kinds of things. But are the greatest spiritual traditions in all of all of them, from the East and from the West, Abrahamic faiths, the Eastern traditions, they've all preached, as far as I know, a certain compassion in, in the face of conflict and a certain interbeing that penetrates even the most uh, violent or difficult situations. And I think it's really hard to hold that right now in popular discourse. And I, it, it scares me because I think it makes people withdraw. Yeah, I, I see that. And, and we have to think of a peace building in a multifaceted, but also multi-layered uh, way, right? So it is important to have uh, critical, thoughtful judgments to make assessments, to yeah. think about where power resides and where fairness and justice can be nourished. But then it's also critical to sort of build uh, things that will make um, the world and our communities better. There needs to be restorative practices. We seem yeah. to stop, in other words, at uh, negative assessments or judgments, and we're yeah. not moving towards productive possibilities and peace building. And I that's think a big problem. I, I really think, look, let's be honest, real peace builders uh, who take the big risk for res restoration, go down the list, you know, Yitzhak Rabin, Anwar Sadat, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, look what happens to them. Uh, many people who actually are willing to reach out the hand to the enemy, uh, it's dangerous work. It is, dangerous. it is. And even, you know, sh falling short of that danger to one's um, life or, or livelihood there, there is somehow not as much of a willingness to simply be uncomfortable as there needs to be right now, right? We need to be able to, even that is some, sometimes lacking or to step outside of uh, the, the safety of what we know everyone um, believes, you know, the echo chamber. Okay, yeah. well, listen, I want to make, let's get to one more question for you, though. Um, the, this next question is, how do you build empathy best in a middle school student? My son said, their problems are sad, but that's their problem. How can I make him more empathetic? Um, well, first of all, there's easy ways to, there, there, there's lots of great curricula that teach empathy, teach you how to show empathy, teach you how to feel empathic, uh, allow you to, first of all, identify feelings. One of the reasons people don't want to deal with other people's feelings is because they don't know how to manage them. Somebody else's sad feelings are difficult feelings. And so if you don't know how to manage them and you don't have them, you don't want to be in somebody else's because they'll be overwhelming or they'll be uncomfortable for you. You mentioned being just uncomfortable. So helping people to understand that all these feelings are normal, that they come for all of us, that they also can go, uh, that there are ways to manage them. So the first thing is naming feelings, understanding how feelings work, understanding that they come and go, understanding that you can manage them. That's the first part of being able to have uncomfortable feelings. Uh, and then learning how, you know, listening skills are very po powerful for, for learning empathy and, 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 and being able to repeat. Uh, Maya, as I could say, Maya has just reminded me that it's important to have uh, the willingness to have uncomfortable feelings. So I'm guessing, Maya, that you're telling me that you've been in situations where you wished people would pay attention to something that would make them uncomfortable. Now I'm just trying to be empathic, right? So you, you can do this in a sixth grade classroom. It's not that hard, you, but teachers need to be trained. So what can you do? You can encourage the school to adopt a social and emotional learning program, uh, encourage teachers to get trained for to implement such a program and uh, 
you know, make, make conversations about feelings normal in your house. So here's one little thing we've done. This can go even down to second and th first graders. Make a feelings dictionary, put it on your wall. Uh, see if you can come up with a hundred words that describe feelings. Uh, it'll take a couple of weeks, maybe even a couple of months, but encourage your son to, to name as many feelings as he can come up with over time. Have it, have it be a contest and then start to normalize the idea that all these feelings will be part of his experience and there's nothing to be afraid of. Mm, that's a great idea. Thank you so much. I wish we had more time with you. I think that we would enjoy um, uh, uh, certainly many more hours and hope that this is just the beginning of your engagement uh, with us as part of our family and certainly our engagement with your work will be all be paying attention. And well, I really appreciate your welcoming me to your community. My, I, I'm grateful for the work you're doing and leading and uh, planting seeds and, you know, th there are going to be some big oak trees come from, uh, from the work of this community and there probably already are and there are more to come. I hope we build a great forest. Absolutely. Uh, and in Hawaii, nourish the lungs have... of the earth and nourish the lungs of our peace building selves. I love it. And in Hawaii, we have banyan trees. And I don't know if you've seen banyans, but you fair know, enough, fair enough. Amazing <laughs> roots and we all, um, uh, all, each of us is, is a representative of one of those roots. But really, thank you. It has been moving and we are deeply grateful. And I want to thank uh, the audience, um, Wendy, for the last question, but all of you for your participation. Sorry if we weren't able to get to all of your questions. Thanks to Jose Barzola and the Matsunaga Institute. To learn more about the Institute, please do visit at peaceinstitute.manoa.hawaii.edu. This conversation will go live, not only through social media, but will also be published in long form via Matsunaga Institute's YouTube page. And uh, we will be distributing it, distributing it uh, through our networks, but please share the link. Uh, with others who might be interested and who might benefit from this conversation and go out and create conversations um, that are inspired by our time together today. Um, please do follow the Matsunaga Institute on Eventbrite to register for future events, careers in peace building and other um, creative and interesting and sometimes difficult conversations. But thank you so much. Thank you all very much. You. Very grateful. Bye-bye.